the appointed hour of six o'clock having been or six o three having been reached i welcome everyone to this meeting of the amherst zoning board of appeals my name is steve judge chair of the amherst zoning board of appeals i hereby call this meeting to order pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 and extended again by chapter 2 of the acts of 2023 this meeting will be conducted via remote means members of the public who wish to access this meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meeting recordings may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. Please indicate you wish to comment by clicking on the raised hand function button when the public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star 9 on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the Zoning, chair of appeals, zoning Board Chair of Appeals Chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their petition will be participation will be discontinued from the meeting. In accordance with the provision of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10 of the Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice that there are and posted and mailed to parties at interest. We'll begin with the roll call of the regular members of the ZBA. Um, Steve Judge is here. Mr. Henry? I, I, here, I, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Philip White. Present. Mr. David Sloviter. Here. Mr. Craig Meadows. Here. And Mr. David Allfeld. He's coming in. There we go. Good evening. We'll note, Just joining you. Yep. We'll note for the record that Mr. Allfeld has said yes. Also in attendance is Jacinta Williams, a planner for the town, Christine Brestrup, the town planning director, and Rob Mora, the Building Commissioner. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 48 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function. When you are recognized, present your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold a public hearing where information about the project and input from the public is gathered followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merit, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there's a 90 day, a 20 day appeal period for an agreed party to contest the decision with a relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, um, approval of consideration of approval of the meet, um, minutes from the meetings of June 27th, 2024, public hearings on ZBA FY 2023-18, ASD Shootsbury, Massachusetts, Solar LLC, request for a special permit under section 3.340 of the zoning bylaw to construct a 9.35 megawatt deep direct current and a 4.4 megawatt alternating current ground mounted solar photovoltaic array spanning 41 acres on a 102 acre site, an accompanying battery, energy storage system, 
and three parcels of land owned by W.D. Cowles, Inc., identified as Map 9B, Parcels 11 and 12, Map 9D, Parcel 27, on Shutesbury Road, RO, Outlying Residential Zoning District. Frontage and access to the subject parcel of land is located between 187 and 201 Shutesbury Road. This is continued from our June 6, 2024 meeting. Uh, John ZBA FY 2024-21, John S. Lane and Son Co Company, Inc. Request for a special permit under sections 10.33, modification, amendment, or renewal, 3.373, removal of soil, sod, loam, sand, gravel, rock, quarry, sown, or other earth products, and 3.374, processing of earth in connection with the authorized removal of a zoning bylaw to renew special permit ZBA FY 2018-32 and continue quarrying operations in the presence premises located at 1550 West Street, map 28A, parcel 10, map 28B, parcels 9, 12, 15, 16, 17, 21, 22, map 28D, parcel 12, in the RLD, Low Density Residence Zoning District. ZBF, ZBA FY 2024-18, Mathena Morrissey, request for a special permit under section 3.3211 of the zoning bylaw to convert a single family dwelling into a non-owner occupied duplex with requested waiver from the sign plan at 180 North Whitney Street, Map 11D, Parcel 261, RG, General Residence Zoning Districts. This is also, this is continued from the June 27th, 2024 meeting. And a public meeting on um, ZBA FY 2006-15, Frank Patel, 15 Hazel Avenue, in accordance with conditions number six of the FY 2006-15 special permit, the new owner shall appear before the ZBA to re review and accept the existing management plan for property located at 15 Hazel Avenue, Map 13D, Parcel 32, RN, Neighborhood Residence Zoning Districts. Then there's a uh, general public comment period, also other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. Uh, just a note, um, we have a couple of things which I think are going to move quickly. That is the Shootsbury matter, the John Lane matter. Those are both public hearings. And there's also the um, public meeting portion for the uh, 15 Hazel Avenue. I think those are, are quick, but I think there'll be considerable discussion on um, ZBA 2024, the 180 North Whitney Street. What I propose we do is we handle the Shootsbury Road, the John Lane, and the Frank Patel, 15 Hazel Avenue first, and then we move to the uh, 180 um, North Whitney Street as a matter of uh, order. Is that a, anybody have a problem with that? Ms. Brestrup? I, I don't have a problem with that, but I'm curious about whether we communicated with Mr. White about um, David Alfeld being on the John Lane project. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you very much. Okay, so the first order of business tonight is approval of the meeting minutes from June 27th, 2024. I've had a chance to read those uh, minutes. I find nothing I think which needs to be changed. Has everybody else had a chance to review those minutes? And if so, do you have any suggestions for changes? I just had one question, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, the square footage for the building, did we capture that correctly? Um, in the minutes, it mentions um, almost 5,000, but this building is quite large. Um, hmm. um, I'm trying to find what page I saw that on. Yeah, it's on page two. You're talking about the... Um, Ron Laverdier. Um, yes. Yeah, it's yeah. page two, so right in the first line, talking about a 5,700 square foot mixed use building. You yeah, know what? I, I, don't can... have, I don't have the original uh, application available to me to check and see if that's correct or not. What I propose we do. I think Ms. Bestrup has her hand up. Yep, Ms. Bestrup. I believe that 5712 refers to the footprint of the building and the building is 
I don't know, three stories or four stories high. Mr. Mora would know more about that, but I believe that the 5700 relates to the footprint of the building. Hmm. Well, you know what I what we could do, um, we could double we could double check on that number and um, consider these the minutes at the next meeting, or we could instruct us, the staff to make the technical and conforming changes to that number to make sure it represents the full um, square footage of the structure. I prefer the latter because um, I don't think it's a substantive issue, but I think it's a good catch. No, I'm, I'm fine either way. No. Why don't we do that? Why don't we approve these, um, unless there's other changes, approve these min min minutes of the meeting contingent on um, the staff checking and then correcting, making technical and conforming changes to the square footage of the building just to make sure it's correct. Do I have such a motion? So moved. So moved. Moved and seconded. Um, the vote occurs, uh, if there's any discussion, if there's none, vote occurs on the motion to approve the minutes. The chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Slobiter? Aye. Motion carries five to nothing. Minutes are approved as with the uh, te with technical and conforming changes to be made by the staff. Uh, the next order of business is um, ZBA FY 2023 ASD Shootsbury MA Solar LLC. I understand from the, uh, from the staff that we've received um, a message from the applicant's uh, representative that they wish this to be continued to a later date. There's no additional information to share with us from the applicant's perspective. Is that correct, Ms. Brestro? That is correct, and I think you have an email to that effect yep, from the applicant. Email. Yep, we do. And do we have a date? Uh, certain to to which to move this? I think they would like to move it to. Oh, sorry. September twelfth. Okay. And but before we do that, so we have a request to move this to continue this to the September twelfth. Um, excuse me for that noise. In reviewing the packet, there are a number of um, comments. And I'm not sure which ones have been read in public comments, and I'm not sure which ones have been read into the record in our previous meetings. Um, I know there's one that seems, one public comment that's um, from June 9th, and I, from, um, hold on a second, that I wanna make sure, what I wanna make sure is that we've got all the public comments read into the record or acknowledged into the record. And we can, and I think we that most of them have already been acknowledged and placed into the record. But there's one from Rachel Loeffler on the on the sixth on the ninth of June that I think is after the meeting that we the last meeting that we took uh, public comments on. Are there any others? I've noticed that the there's an email from Nancy Haver, and that's also that's on the sixth, which was I think the last meeting. There's one from on June third from Phil Rich, and there's also a memo from uh, Janet McGowan, dated June fifth. But other than those, I don't think there's any other public comments that have not been acknowledged and placed into the record. All right, so um, the next order, what we need to do is um, approve the continuance to September 12th, you said? That's correct. September 12th at 6 p.m. Um, do I have a motion to do so? So moved. Is there a second? Second. 
All right, it's been moved and seconded to move this to September 12th at 6 p.m. Continue it to September 12th at 6 p.m. Chair votes aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Great. Now, um, Ms. Brestrup, I know we have some more meetings coming up um, on this topic that involve briefings from um, our council. Can you just give us the dates for that? And as well as if there's anything, if there's a, a progress report that you have on the peer reviews or where we stand on that. Can we just uh, provide that information at this point? Yes, um, we were supposed to get um, responses from the uh, peer review, the RFP that we put out for peer review um, on the 23rd. And um, the person who receives those responses is not in the office. She's um, off for a few days. So I called her and I emailed her, but um, I don't know if, you know, what kind of response we've gotten. So, um, so that's kind of an open question. Oh, However, the Zoning Board of Appeals um, voted on June 6th to give staff authorization to review the responses and to hire um, the consultants. So there's no need to wait for your next meeting to do that. So as soon as we get um, the responses and have a chance to review them and hire somebody, we will um, be able to report to you at your next meeting. Great. And let's see, the other thing is um, WSP. Um, I was in touch with them recently. They're supposed to uh, be reviewing glare and battery storage, and they um, don't have anything to report yet. And then the third thing is that Jonathan Murray of KP Law will be um, giving a presentation to the Zoning Board of Appeals about the legal aspects of solar um, <clears throat> on August 22nd, and that will start at 6 p.m. Um, and so it'll be a presentation to you all. I, I believe it was Mr. Uh, Meadows who requested this. You have received a presentation about um, you know, the, the legal and permitting aspects of solar, um, but that was last year. And so um, I think we, we felt, Mr. Meadows felt that it would be good to have a refresher on that. And it would be informative for the public as well as for um, Zoning Board of Appeals members. So Jonathan Murray's planning to come and or be on Zoom and spend at least an hour to pr present to you and answer your questions. Great. Okay. All right, good, thank you. All right, uh, the next order of business is ZBA um, FY 2024-21, John S. Lanes and Son requests for a special permit to continue quarrying operations. And the premises is located at 1550 West Street. Um, why don't we bring in everybody from that? And I wanna make note that for this panel, um, our associate, Mr. Alfeld, is serves on the panel. Uh, Mr. White does not serve on this panel. Um, we held a site visit on Tuesday afternoon at, the, at the, the site at which we met with the representatives of the company. We viewed the, um, the quarry itself. We viewed the, um, we looked towards the boundaries uh, of the quarry and where it, possibilities for it to move in the future. We inquired about the depth of the, um, the current mine, uh, quarrying operation, how much farther it had to go to reach the groundwater. We looked at the, uh, the original cut from the mount, uh, of the mountain. We observed the machinery located both, both in the quarry itself and the, and the crushing machinery up on, the plat on a, the, an area that has not been quarried yet or is not presently being quarried. Um, and we viewed where the um, quarry, how it may move, and, and when it does, the equipment goes down into the quarry. We heard a lot about the history of the company. We also heard a lot about um, the history of the area and the use of the stone and, the, and uh, general information about the business of quarrying, which uh, I found interesting and informative. Um, that would be my report. Does anybody have anything more they want to report 
on the uh, site visit. Mr. Sloboder. Uh, in our discussion with the with the two representatives of the company, they clarified that they are not asking for any changes to the conditions or the operation of the quarry. Okay. That's right. Mr. Alfield, you had your hand up. Yep. Thank you. I just to remark that uh, we also saw the traffic patterns that are used to load trucks. Um, and also we observed the distance from the road, uh, West Road, to the uh, quarry face. Good. Yep, that's exactly right. And Ms. Brestrup, you were taking notes. Is there anything else that we need to remark for the record? Mm -hmm. Or you, Jacinta, you also were. So if there's anything to add, I think that pretty much covers it, though. I think All it right. covers it. Mm -hmm. We have... Um, the only submission that we've received on this is uh, is from uh, it's from the um, Aaron Jacques, who had originally had some ideas for conditions. Um, on June first, she clarified her position. Um, at later, we'll ask the representative of, of the company about this. She clear and later clarified that if there's nothing done within the um, buffer zone or the, within the resource area, there's no requirements from the CONCOM, but we can ask a question on that. I don't think there's any other um, submissions other than those from the applicant, which include just the request for a ZBA application site map, a management plan form, uh, the 2024 site management plan, a mining map as well, and then there is uh, stormwater pollution prevention plan on the, uh, a map site from, from 2021, GS, GIS aerial map, a special permit decision from 2018, special permit decision from 2013, and a special permit decision from 2008. So um, I guess, Mr. Co Crossett, are you representing the uh, applicant? Yes, uh, and uh, thank you for having us on the agenda tonight. I'm Kyle Crossett. Yep, um, name and address for the record. Yep. Okay. Uh, in addition, I've got uh, Jason Capel and Pete Barrett with us, um, uh, Director of Technical Services and Vice Assistant Vice President for Peckham Industries as well. Great. Thank you. You may proceed. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, we're here tonight to uh, request of the board uh, approval for a five-year special permit for earth extraction to continue our operations as has been um, historically performed at our uh, Amherst quarry. Um, there are no changes to the method or um, area of mining. We uh, intend to stay within our currently affected area with no new acreage affected. Um, and, uh, we have outlined in our map, the area that we expect to mine over the next five years, um, pretty straightforward. And, um, we request, or we, uh, would like to continue to abide by our management plan as has been uh, done historically. Thank you. I guess um, if you have nothing else to say, the one question I have is you have no, it's correct that you have no uh, intention to work within the buffer zone or within the resource areas um, on your site. Is that correct? That is correct. And you've worked and you've met with the CONCOM and they're comfortable with this. Is that correct? That is correct. Are there any questions from board members? Mr. Alfeld. Just wanted to follow up a little bit on a conversation we had yes uh, on Tuesday at the site visit. Um, we heard a little bit about depth to groundwater, and uh, I wonder if Mr. Cross it could elaborate on that. I'm curious. Uh, my recollection is what is that you said there was just one point of observation of the water table elevation. Yeah, we uh, have a we have a well down near the crusher in the southern part of the quarry. Um, 
I had, and I just want to make a correction. When I was out there initially, I said 20 feet. Um, I actually double checked and it's more like uh, 50, 50 to 60 feet below the current um, elevation of the quarry floor. So um, as of now, there's no uh, chance of interacting with, with that aspect of the site. And if I can follow up, um, do you take regular measurements at that well to see if there are seasonal fluctuations or? Um, uh, I mean, there's there's certainly going to be seasonal fluctuations, but we do not take regular measurements. We just have um, a few data points from past observations. Okay. Thank you. Are there other questions from? Board members for the applicant. If not, are there any public comments? Any members of the public who wish to comment on this? If you do, so so indicate by using the raised hand function on your phone, on your uh, computer, or star nine on your phone. There are no hands in the attendee list. Great. All right. Um, there are no further questions from board members and nothing further from the applicant. Go ahead, Mr. Alfeld. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, 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 this may be a point of discussion for um, in, a, in a few minutes, but um, I just want to clarify that the intention for Mr. Cross, that the intention is to, in the area indicated on the mining map, to drop the uh, elevation down to about 485 feet above mean sea level, which is the same elevation as in the southern part of the of the current uh, quarry. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, when we were out there taking a look and, and standing on that uh, top bench next to the plant, um, that face that was to the south of us is going to be moved to the north. Um, and, you know, as that moves, the plant actually is going to be relocated to the quarry floor. Um, but, yeah. you know, over the next uh, five years and probably beyond, that's the only area we plan on mining. And to that depth. To the, correct, to that depth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. If there are no further uh, comments from board members or from the applicant, I would entertain a motion that we uh, continue the public, we keep the public hearing open while we move to a public meeting on this matter. Um, so so we have such a motion. It's moved, we have a second. It's moved and seconded. Um, if there's no discussion, the vote occurs on the motion to continue the public hearing while we move to a public meeting. Chair votes aye. Mr. Slobiter? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Alfeld? Aye. Motion carries five to nothing. We're in the public meeting portion. The public meeting portion is where the, the uh, members get a chance to deliberate on the matter before them. And it's generally not an opportunity for public comment. Um, I think there's no reason to, I mean, there's every reason to uh, approve the request to continue the operation as it is. And with the uh, information we received and the information from the CONCOM, I'm really comfortable with this. I don't know about anybody else. Question, Mr. Chair. Yes, you sure may. Um, so one of the things that Ms. Williams said on the site visit um, in terms of the, the, the five-year grant of this permit was that it cannot be extended um, beyond five years. Um, and I read that um, in, in, in Oh, you just, you're, um, you froze on us, Mr. Henry. Finding that we have to, the question was, um, rather, oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay. can, am I clear now? Start again. Yeah, start again, please. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. No, so one of the things that Ms. Williams um, pointed out on the site visit was the five-year um, requirements, um, and it we have to make that in the findings, not extend it beyond the five years. My question was, um, <clears throat> it also said that we may have the ability, uh, rather we do, um, to do increments. So rather than having the quarry come back before the board within five years, if nothing is changing, and by nothing, I mean that in absolute, 
we're just extending the permit. Um, it seems if we have the ability to say it can be extended um, for another five years, provided that nothing is changing in terms of how they're operating, doing business. Is that is that a good understanding, Ms. Williams? No. So what I was saying at the um, site visit was that I initially thought that that's how the zoning bylaw read. But after discussing it with our building commissioner, he okay. explained to me that we can only do five year increments. Um, so and we can't do say 10 or 20 or 25. We just, they just have to come back every five years to renew the permit. No, I, I understood that. So okay. we wouldn't, we wouldn't extend it for 10 years, but again, they come to say um, the building commissioner understanding that nothing is changing, just have them extend the permit. Can, is that permissible? That's a good question. Uh, Mr. Mora, do you want to weigh in? I don't believe so because the, the criteria says upon reapplication. So I, it's reapplication to the board under the special permit process uh, to, um, you know, be considered for that up to five year extension, renewal or reissuance. So I think um, every five years they need to reapply. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments from board members? <laughs> Mr. Alfeld? Um, I was looking at the conditions suggested by staff and I noted that the first four conditions from the 2018 uh, permit are not present in the conditions proposed for the for the permit for the current permit. Um, and, and I guess they're in the management plan. So this is perhaps just a question for me to understand: Is the management is is compliance with the management plan presumed as part of uh, satisfying the permit? Well, yes, normally it is presumed that, you, that if you have a man, you have to comply with the management plan. I mean, it's, it's not an explicit condition. It's just presumed. Well, it's sometimes um, an explicit condition, but it is assumed. Um, okay. I would be more comfortable having all the conditions stated, one through three stated as well. Uh, I, Even though there is a, a management plan, I think that makes more sense. I mean, it was a but Ms. Brestrup, I see you have your hand up. I was going to respond to the question about the management plan, and I think that you should um, make uh, a, a condition that the operation will be um, operated in accordance with the management plan that is approved tonight. Um, and I don't remember the first three conditions, so I apologize for that. But it seems that carrying over the conditions from the previous permit makes sense to me, if it makes sense to Mr. Mara. You know, and, and I, I have to admit that I did not look at those. Oh, good. Who's All right, so the ones that are there are quarrying mm -hmm. shell. The open face type does not create pits or quarry holes and the operation shall not be a low port flow of blood. The notch where 116 crosses the royal range. Suitable precautions shall be taken according to the best industry practice to protect the public against injury arising from blasting or any other aspect of the quarry and rock. Uh, specific oh, specific precautions shall be taken to warn hikers and administration of the not visitor center before blasting activity takes place. In addition to the normal precautions, sounding horns and posting observers at strategic locations, the authorities of the quarry shall inform the visitor center of each planned blasting activity one hour before the blasting takes place. Yeah, I think those should be contained um, in the in the list of conditions. So I would, I would um, want to amend the conditions in the project application report to include one through three. And, I, and, and we heard from the applicant on the site that they do the, um, they take the precautions for hikers um, and um, the protection of the public. So I don't think that is something they currently do and I think they should be. <laughs> oh, raise hand. Yep. And lastly, um, we've got uh, Ms. Brestrup and then Mr. Offeld and then Ms. Brestrup. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, as you know, this is my first panel, so I've enthusiastically <laughs> studied <laughs> the previous permit and the current proposed conditions. And the pr proposed conditions one through 10 are identical to the previous conditions five through 14. So that they're, they're carried over. Yeah. It's just the previous permit conditions one through four have, are no longer there. The first two of those four um, require that a management plan be put in place, which obviously is happening. And the other two have to do, uh, old condition number three is change of ownership and old condition number four is decommissioning or reclamation. And those are both described in the, manage, the new management plan. So I think we're covered. It's just the question of if you're required to, carry out the management plan that implies the the existence of those old conditions the the um implementation of those old conditions it does and in this case i think those are two two topics that are um important enough to have in the continuing the conditions that there be a reclamation plan and that there's a, a change of ownership so uh, if there is a change of ownership the provision for that. So I, I think we should include the old conditions and we should include a condition to make sure that the new manager, that the operation is run in accordance with in, uh, the new man, the management plan uh, on that we have before us. Um, Ms. Brestrup, did you have your hand up? My question has been, um, my, the answer has been clarified. Thank you. Okay. We do have, normally we don't call upon people who, uh, from the public, but in this case, we might need some additional information and we can do that. Mr. Kappel, I see your hand is up. Which, do you wish to add something to our discussion here? Mr. Kappel, you're, uh, there you go. Uh, yes, uh, Jason Kappel. Give, give, with... give us your name and address, Mr. Kappel, for the record. Uh, Jason Kappel, uh, Peckham Industries. 763 Schoharie Turnpike, Athens, New York. All right. I just wanted to say that uh, as a representative of the applicant, we have no issue with reincorporation of prior permit conditions, even though they're cited in the um, operations plan. Um, we have no objection to restatement of the prior conditions as part of the permit. All right. Thank you. All right, if there's no, are there any other questions, comments, opinions from board members regarding this? Mr. Offeld, do you have your hand up? I did, yes, I do. Thank yep. you. I have one more. And that has to do with the depth of excavation. Um, can one of the conditions describes the limits of excavation? Um, oh, I don't have that handy. Which number is it? Five. Number eight of, of the, okay. Um, yeah, number eight lists the area. So number eight, any aspects of the quarry operation to be conducted? I'm sorry, number seven. Quarry shall be contained in the area designated by the board as shown on the mining map. Uh, and there's a date for that mining map. Yep. Uh, dated May 28 and stamped by uh, Robert Ferenko, registered professional engineer. It showed the map shows the area, but it doesn't. I'm not sure the depth is explicitly. Well, um, there there is a cross section view on that map, and I ha actually, if you want me to share my screen, I can pull that map up. Um, but there is a cross-section view that kind of gives you an idea of the elevations involved, if you'd like me to, to show that. You can share your screen, but I'm not sure that, that showing us that would give Mr. answers to Mr. Alfeld's question, which is, is there a I limit? Think, is that right? Yeah, and I think that the, the, there is an intended limit, which I asked about earlier, the 485 feet. Um, so I think the condition 
if if condition proposed condition number seven in the staff's report is amended to read quarry shall be contained in the area and depth designated by the board as shown on the mining map and that depth is shown on that map in a cross section okay that that would satisfy my th this concern i've got thank you so mr offeld wishes to amend condition seven in the staff report to add the word and words and depth after the word area yeah all right are there is there any discussion about that is there i do you move that mr offeld is that motion to do so to move to amend the condition you do oh, I yes i do I do. I do do you need yes, a second yep, you need a second second so move. We got a second uh any discussion if not the vote occurs on the motion to amend the condition the chair votes aye mr offeld aye mr Slobiter. aye meadows aye mr henry aye uh, the vote is five to nothing to approve the amendment um all right any other comments questions or amendments to the conditions before we get to if not the question occurs on the conditions as proposed so um jacinta will you put those conditions up on the we have to approve the conditions before we move to findings so if you'll put those conditions back up on the screen thank you so the conditions that were approving are before us they include one through three which were not in the staff report um and then move down the additional word that um words that mr offeld included and so that would be here add area and depth and then we have included um all right i guess 11 isn't needed because we've got one through four there is that right Excuse me, I think that um, we're getting a little confused. I think Jacinta meant to add the conditions that were from the previous permit, and that's why she put 11 in there. She's reminding herself to include it when she writes up the final. The three conditions that are at the top on the other page are conditions that are specific to this case here. So Jacinta is saying she's going to go back to the old permit from 2018 and resurrect the conditions one through four from that permit. No, and then um, and then I think 11 and 12 might be the same, but I'm not sure. Yeah. And then 13 is a new one. So anyway, I, I'm saying that you need 11. Don't, you need 11. don't, okay. don't discard 11 because <laughs> Jacinta right. is going to reword that by bringing in the old conditions one through four from the previous permit. All right. And then the, the other thing I would say is approved new management plan as approved. I think we have to have something that the operation com, uh, complies with the management plan as approved on July 25th. I think. Mr. Mora has his hand up. Mr. Mora. Yeah, I was just going to mention, I, I think you only need conditions two through four from the original permit uh, because the the management plan is submitted with this application. So there's no reason for that to have to occur within 90 days. Okay. But we do need to have the condition that the management, that the operations comply with the management plan, correct, Mr. Morrow? Yes, I think two, three, and four of that 2018 mm -hmm. permit belong in this new permit. Just I don't think number one is applicable anymore because you All have right. that updated management plan dated May 24 of two, 2024. So, all right. So it is, this is confusing. It's something we, it should be pretty easy, but it's So we don't see two through two through four from the old conditions do we hold on let me us? pull them up one second yeah. all right 
Thank you. All right, number one is the 90 days. We don't need that. Number two, we follow it at all times. So that solves the problem that we may not need those new conditions at the end. Should center this is the approved management plan. Shall we follow it at all times? That satisfies that. Change of ownership. Great. So you'll include that. Mm -hmm. And we'll include number four. I can All do right. that now. Would you like to have a date associated with number two where it um, talks about the approved management plan? I don't know that we... A date of the approved management plan as, as of today's date. Yeah. Yeah, that would be... Let's see. And then just put the... Yep, in response plan, let's put that right... So for 11, the new 11 that you just brought down, put in as of July 25th, 2024, after the word plan, right? There we go, she'll be followed. And she'll come before the, that's right. Change of ownership, meeting and management plan at the other. All right, so 12 is correct. I numbered incorrectly, but it's correct. Yeah. Yep, number um, 16. Just mm -hmm. a minute. Yep, we want to have that. All right, that's. Do we still note. need 19? Well, that's just a note to you yeah. to make sure that all of, right? Yeah, I would think so. So that, I think we've got them all, so. Unless somebody feels differently, I think we ought to eliminate that. 19. We don't need 20, the approval of the new management plan, because we referenced that up above. And we don't need 21. All right. Is everybody comfortable with the conditions as we've got them stated for us? Okay. What I would do is I, have a, I would entertain a motion to approve the um, conditions as um, as on the sheet, but it's on the screen before us. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Aye. Oh, it's moved and seconded to approve the conditions. The vote occurs. No discussion. The vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Offeld? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Slobiter? Aye. Aye. And, uh, <laughs> Mr. Meadows? <clears throat> Aye. All right. The conditions are approved. Next, we have to make our findings. I note, and I have not, uh, it's been five years since I've done findings on the uh, excavation section of the, <laughs> of, of the bylaw, but it looks as if the staff staff made the findings um, that, and it does not require that we make findings separately from that. Is that correct, Ms. Restrup or Mr. Mora? We need to make specific findings for sections 3.37 or is it sufficient for it to be stated in the project application report? I think you could accept the findings that were written by staff. You, you could adopt right. those findings. That's probably a good idea. Yep, let's do that. So we'll accept section three, the staff findings in section 3.37. And we will go through the 10, and, and we'll also go through 10.38 at this point, time. Section 10.33, modifications or renewals. So um, we'll, we'll also include in the motion to approve the staff review of section 10.3 special permits, but 10.38, um, the proposal is suitably located in a neighborhood which is proposed. I think that's right. 10.382, 383, 385, and 387 does not constitute a nuisance due to air and water pollution. This operation has been going on for 150, 130 years. I don't think it's, it hasn't proved to be a, a nuisance yet. 10.384, uh, adequate and appropriate facilities provided for proper operation. I think there are enough sanitary facilities there. 10.386, 
proposal ensures there's conformance with the parking sign regulations. Um, oh, the parking facilities that are sufficient. Um, you're asking a waiver from the site plan, but there aren't any new signs going to be added. So I think we can find uh, if they comply with 10 point, we can make the finding of the required out of 10.386. 10.387 provides safe vehicular traffic and pedestrian movement within the site, um, as was stated in, in our staff visit, our site review, as well as the staff review. I think they have uh, a safe and um, vehicular pattern for both uh, vehicles and, and, and uh, pedestrians within the site. 10.388 ensures adequate space for the off-street loading and parking. It's their business, they do that. 10.389, proposed adequate methods of disposal of sewage reef refuge. Um, the USA Waste takes care of their, their, their waste and their, um, their refuse. 10.390, protection from flood hazards. Um, there is precautions taken to deal with additional um, uh, rain and uh, water in the site. There's a small stream in one of the partial subject regulations of the zoning bylaw. No work is proposed in that area. 10.391 um, hiking trails are north of the site and are um, undisturbed, and protection is provided for hikers. And notice notification and precautions. 10.392 adequate landscaping for adjacent properties. Um, they're a long ways from the uh, many residential areas and it's been uh, an un, it's been operating for a long time without any complaints. 10.393, the proposal price on traditional property by minimizing the intrusion of lighting. I think it's all, um, the lights are downcast, the rear wall is to upcast lights, but the lighting is, um, does not seek to be changed and it's, it continues as, as it has. 10.394, the proposal avoids to the extent feasible impact on steep slopes. Um, Berms will be continued, and the, the uh, just lastly, the proposal does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain, to the use and scale and architecture of existing buildings. I don't think that's applicable. 10.396 uh, provides screening for storage areas. They do that. 10.397 requires that we find the ac adequate recreation facilities. That's not, uh, not applicable. 10.398 proposals in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the bylaws. And the goals of the master plan, um, it, as long as it, uh, as it complies with the um, requirements of this special permit, it does so. So I find that we can make, I, I propose that we can make the findings required under 10 point, 10 point 10.38, as well as sections, and accept the staff recommendations on sections 3.37, as well as section 10.3 special permits. Do I have such a, do I have such a motion? Excuse me, do I have such a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? May I make a suggestion? Yes. There's one, 10.388 um, is about off street loading and unloading of vehicles. And the staff review says that um, the application doesn't address this and suggests that the board should inquire about this at a public hearing. I think that um, finding should be changed to find that you find that the off-street loading and unloading of vehicles is done in a proper manner because I think most of what they're going to be doing is loading and unloading rock and stone, right? So you don't want to be left with a finding that is asking a question. You want to be left with a finding that makes a statement, right? Correct. So how would you like to word that? Staff. I think that we find that the proposal provides adequate place, adequate space for off street loading and unloading of vehicles, goods, products, materials, and equipment in the normal operation of the establishment or use. I Thank you. That, I think we just find that, it, um, and then we repeat the words of the finding that we have to make. Yep, that's that works. Yep. Okay, so um, 
I move that we amend the, our findings as stated. Is there a second? And then we'll, then we'll vote on all the findings at the end, but first we have to amend the, the existing findings. Sorry. Is there a second? I hear a second. Any discussion yes. on the motion? All right, vote occurs on the motion to amend the findings in section 10.388 to include um, an affirmative statement that meets those requirements. The chair votes aye. Mr. Offeld? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Slobiter? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Motion is five to nothing. The amendment carries. Now we vote on the conditions as a whole. Um, and we already have a motion out there. Is there any further discussions on that motion to approve the conditions and accept the staff reviews? If not, so the, yep, if not the, vote, the vote occurs on the motion, which is already before us. As amended, the chair votes aye. Mr. Offeld? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Slobiter? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. The vote now, the final final vote is to, uh, final question before us is to approve the special permit application to provide for a five-year extension for John S. Lane and companies. Um, that is ZBA FY 2024-21. Do I have such a motion to approve the special permit? So moved. Slow it or moves, second. is there a second? Second. second. Mr. Meadows seconds it. Any discussion? If not, the, chair, the vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Slobiter? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Alfeld? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. The vote is five to nothing. The special permit is, a, is approved with conditions. And uh, the, spe the public hearing is closed on this matter. Thank you very much, everyone. Congratulations. I hope you continue to provide another 100, 100 years of work at the site. <laughs> Us too. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Thank you All very right. much. Yeah. Have a good night, guys. You too. Mr. Offeld, Bye. thank you for your participation in this. We appreciate it. You're welcome to stay around, uh, but we'll bring Mr. Henry back up for the other matters. Thank you. Thank you. I will, I will return to the audience, I think. Uh, so log off now. All right, thank, thank you very you. much. All right, the next order of business is um, a public meeting on ZBA 2016-15 Frank Patel, 15 Hazel Avenue in accordance with condition six of the 2006-15 special permit. The new owner shall appear before the ZBA to review and accept the existing management plan for property located at 15 Hazel Avenue, map 13D, parcel 32, neighborhood residence, zoning district. Um, hold on, Mr. Patel, I need to get your paper in front of me. Here we go. Mr. Patel, um, we don't have any um, submissions that have to be um, noted, do we, except for the old, uh, the existing special permits from 2006, which we've received, as well as yeah, they're all the entirety of the 2006 special permit. Is there anything else, Ms. Brestrup, that we have to note for the record? As this is, this is just a public meeting, and we're really just approving the um, the management plan. Mr. Patel is attesting that he will abide by the existing management plan. Okay, and Mr. Patel. Um, do you wish to make any presentation on this? I mean, do, did you recently purchase this property? That is correct, yes. I, uh, oh, first of all, can you can you hear me? Yep, we can. Just give us your oh. name and address for the record. Sure. So my first name is Frank. My last name is Patel. And yes, I just uh, recently bought this property. And my plan is to continue using it. Same, like there are no changes in the property. So I, I I would like to continue using it as a rental property. And okay. yeah. Go ahead. And again, I, I'm just requesting to to approve the permit. Go ahead. So I'm I'm looking for the management plan from 2006. 
I think it's the management plan that you have to, that you are going to comply with. And if I recall correctly, that management plan says that the property would be managed by the owners who live two, two houses down. That's not you, is it, Mr. Patel? You two houses down? No, but I live in Hadley, so it's only like a f less than a five minute drive. Yeah, I, but we do need to note that it looks like the management, I think the management plan needs to be updated because the, yeah, I'm looking at the management plan dated um, 11-14-05 is approved. Is there a later management plan than this that you know of or that the staff is aware of? If needed, I can uh, submit the updated management plan, but I, I plan to manage myself. And uh, I don't do you manage other Do you manage other property, Mr. Patel? That is correct, yes. So uh, I also own the property right next to this property. And okay. uh, I manage a few rental properties, me and my wife both. So um, I have experience of managing the properties for the last 15 years. So um, this is non-owner occupant residential Correct. Uh, rental. Correct. And, to, and um, I think that the management plan shows that the, oh, the management would be done by somebody who lives two doors down, and that is not the case. So we have to amend your your management plan. It needs to be amended to reflect that. Sure. And. I asked Mr. Moore and Ms. Brestrup, we don't, in, in this situation, do we require a um, professional management company, an owner, an, a, a resident manager, or a, somebody else? Isn't there um, provisions of the zoning bylaw that requires, that restrict, not restrict, but condition the management uh, to either own, to non-owner occupant, either a um, professional management company, somebody who's done it, somebody who's competent or a resident manager? Am Mr. Mora should really answer that. Okay. The, this property is in the RN district. It doesn't have that specific uh, criteria that the RG district has in the zoning bylaw. Right. Uh, so at the time it wouldn't have required it. It doesn't at this time. Um, but, you know, as you noted, the, the management plan should be updated under Mr. Patel's ownership and, you know, um, letterhead along with, um, you know, the condition you noted, also the condition related to trash and recycling should be updated. I'm not sure um, that's accurate. And I'd also recommend that the complaint response portion of the management plan be incorporated at this time. And we should have the, um, the, the complaint response and the, and the record keeping that we've used with other rental properties consistently as well should be part of this or are we, are, are we not allowed to make that condition we can make, make that part of the management plan that they comply with the residential residential rental process as well as uh, logging complaints with the city um, as well right yeah so this isn't an opportunity to amend conditions or add conditions to the right. permit so um, you know you can work with the applicant on on suggesting things you'd like to see in the management in in this owner's management plan, uh, and you know work on that together to get to the the management plan that you would accept as being updated. Okay, so I think, Mr. Patel, um, I don't have any problem with you running this uh, renting out this property and managing it, but this this management plan is is needs updating, okay. as Mr. Um, Mr. Morris stated. And I, I would think that we also, you also should have in the management, in your management plan, uh, a recognition that you need, that you will get um, the, uh, you'll comply with the residential rental uh, provisions of the Amherst bylaw, as well yeah. as um, we'll share with you uh, the condition, the language that is contained in conditions that you could voluntarily include into your management plan that would require you to um, inform the, the city when you have um, com complaints and when you renew your, your residential um, permit, 
the rental permit, you have to uh, file those as well. So okay. we'll give you those. If you can come up with that, if you come up with those provisions, then I think this should be, uh, it could be approved. So what I'd okay. like to do is, is have you uh, work with the staff immediately, come up with that, and we could either delegate the staff to approve it based on that, or I, but I think you'd probably want to just come back and show that to us and we can quickly approve the management plan. It would be my preference. And we can do that within the, at the next meeting if you can do that. Okay. Is that, so, are you amenable to that? So I just need to make a management plan and submit to who? Well, you could, I think you should submit it so that we can re, re-examine it at our next meeting. If you can okay. make the, submit the management plan with those changes, work with the staff, and then we could have you up at, at the next, as soon as, you know, as soon as possible and just review okay. it. Are okay. you, would that be fine with you? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so why don't we do that? Ms. Brestrup, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I suggest that Mr. Patel make an appointment to meet with um, Ms. Williams and Mr. Mora to um, flesh out these things, to make sure that he includes everything that is necessary in the management plan, and then he can bring that back at the next uh, opportunity to the ZBA for approval. That sounds great. So you'll do that, Mr. Patel, and then we'll put you on the agenda for the, as, as soon as that's done, we'll put you on the next, uh, next meeting agenda so we don't delay this very much longer. Sure. No okay. problem. All right, let's do that. So I guess what we want to do here is continue. Do we need to officially continue this as a public meeting or do we just we don't need to vote on that. All right, so you'll come back and you'll put it on the agenda. The staff will put it on the agenda. Great. So we've dealt with, um, and thank you, Mr. Patel. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in, in just a thank couple you. of weeks. Thank All you. Right. Thank, thank you for your time. Good luck. Thank you. you bet. Um, next order of business is we're going back to a public hearing ZBA FY 2024 18, Mathena Morrissey, request for a special permit under section 3.3211 of the zoning bylaw to convert a single family uh, dwelling into a non-owner occupied duplex with a requested waiver from the sign plan, 180 North Whitney Street, map 11D, parcel 261 RG, general residence zoning district. This is continued from June 27, 2024. I guess what I'd like to do is um, note what I think are additional submissions that we've received. One is from Athena Morrissey. I don't have a date on it, but it identifies four points, um, which include an updated site plan, parking spaces, an updated lease. She, I mean, she references the updated lease and she attached it that. She's proposing a neighborhood block party and um, said she's willing to work, and she, the fourth point is willing to work with the neighborhoods in creating a, a calming traffic struck infrastructure. Um, we've also received, I think since the last meeting, comments from public comments from Florence Rosenstock that came in on, I don't have a date on it, but I noticed it was forwarded on June 20th. I have, um, we received a public comment on June 25th from Kurt Wise and Rachel Brody. I, this may have already been submitted, but I want to make sure everything is in the record. We've also received a, it looks like a June 25th, so, uh, but from Lori Tannenbaum, which I'm not sure got into the record at the time, but I wanted to make sure that her email was included in the record as, a, as for our um, additional public comments. And if we have the, I'm looking for the project application report here. Is there any, and there is uh, updated management plan submitted on July 9th, an application update with site plans and details. We have a sample leaf, a new sample lease, um, a new sheet SP1, a site prepared by Robert Levesque. And those are the, 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 the new, the new um, 
application submissions. I think we've yeah, we've identified the new public comments. And that's it. So um, the next thing is for the um, the applicant to make the presentation. And I think Mr. Reedy, um, you're representing the applicant, correct? I am, Mr. Chair. What we'll do is why don't we get your presentation and when you end the presentation, we'll take our five minute break and then we'll come back. All right. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson and Amherst 6 Southeast Street here on behalf of the applicant and with me this evening, I've got Mathena Morrissey, uh, you probably recognize from last time and also her dad, Jim Morrissey. Um, so yeah, Mr. Chair, I know you had gone through the list of the material that was submitted. I think what I'd like to do is just reacclimate everybody to the neighborhood, talk a little bit about the zoning district, the powers of the zoning board of appeals in that zoning district for this specific circumstance, and then talk just a little bit about, show you the updated site plan, and then just talk a little bit about what you said in the management plan, and then it's probably a good time to break after that. So what I will do, again, just to acclimate everybody to where we are, this is uh, 180 North Whitney Street right here, um, in Amherst uh, Schools, and I could uh, zoom out to show you a little bit more. Um, we've got, for the zoning map, this is zoned RG, and so that's General Residence Zoning District. This use, uh, non-owner occupied duplex, is allowed by special permit in the zoning district. Um, the in this zoning district, the lot area that is required for uh, a two-family is actually uh, fourteen thousand five hundred square feet. This lot has a little over twenty-two thousand square feet, and so it actually could have. Uh, an apartment, a three family on it. So it's got sufficient area. In, in that instance, you would need 20,000 square feet. This would have that 20,000 square feet. The applicant isn't seeking an apartment. They're just seeking a non-owner occupied two family. What's unique in this zoning district about a non-owner occupied two family is that the permit expires upon change of ownership. And so that's actually built into uh, your use table 3.3211. Uh, the third one under there, in the RG district, a special permit granted under this section shall lapse upon any change of ownership of the subject property. And so, you know, for the board's consideration, when you're issuing this permit, you're issuing it to Mathena and, and her dad um, for uh, the life that they own this property. The next phrase in that section is, the special permit granting authority may impose a review of compliance with special permit conditions at such intervals as it deems reasonable. And so something to consider for the board is if you wanted to put a frequency, let's say um, the board issues this permit with conditions and then puts a condition there with uh, where a year from the receipt of a certificate of occupancy, Mathena has to come back for a review of compliance uh, of the conditions and just to frankly see how it's gone. Um, one other piece to mention here is, and and you know, I think Mr. Judge, I don't know if Mr. Meadows was on when when uh, Mr. Parent was the the chair, but he would often talk about the use of the use, and I think that's what we're really talking about here. You know, as a single family home, there aren't conditions that the town can place on this. Um, there's no real limitation to the number of guests. There's not that uh, hook attached, so to speak. You wouldn't have the ability to, upon change of ownership, uh, really do anything. It could go to a new owner um, and there is no expiration and there is no review of compliance with any conditions because there aren't any conditions in a single family home. And so I remember, I remember Mr. Parrott would always say, allowing this non-owner occupied duplex also then allows the town to place conditions to ensure the proper use, management, and operation of this property. And so just as, as you know, you're going to hear from the abutters tonight, I'm sure, they're going to have different comments. I want the board just to remember those items. It expires upon change of ownership. Um, 
it's the use of the use. And also you have the ability to put a, a condition on the re a review of the compliance. And so what I'll do is I'll show you the updated site plan and then we'll talk a little bit about that management. Um, let me bring up the site plan. And it's it's a, a really simple change that um, Mathena made to the site plan. And it really was uh, in response to what we heard at the last hearing. Um, it is to, so if you, if you can see my screen, we've got on this side, this is the, the driveway. Um, north is to the right. This is the driveway that had existed. And then you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten parking spaces now on site. You know, some of the um, testimony that we heard was uh, a fear of on street parking. I think, again, going back to the size of this site in relation to the RG zoning district generally, and, and that there is excess area at the site. And instead of putting another unit, Mathena is looking to have this site operate appropriately for those two units, which then allows, you know, it's these 10 parking spaces. Um, it would allow eight spaces to be designated for both units combined and have two parking spaces available for guests. Doesn't take into account any area within the driveway where um, if there was an additional guest, then that guest could park, you know, double park, so to speak, behind one of the other uh, vehicles. Um, Speaking about guests, uh, Mathena has updated the lease to include a guest policy where there's there can be no more than 10 guests per unit, except in extraordinary circumstances. So let's say a family is renting this and a child's having a birthday. Uh, in that circumstance, it's likely that with uh, consent of the landowner, they would be allowed to have more than 10 guests. But at that point, they at least have to come back to the landowner before they can just have that many people at the property. Um, we've also got a, a couple additional ideas. Um, Athena grew up in Amherst. One of her suggestions and that she found very useful was um, dispelling any fear of the unknown. And we, I know we've heard a lot about uh, these are going to be students. These are going to be students. Well, first of all, there's no guarantee they're going to be students. I think Mathena looks at this as an investment and uh, she's going to be spending real money to, to uh, she built, she spent real money to buy the place. She spent real money to fix it up and she's spending real money to add on to it. And so she wants that investment protected. And so she's going to find the, the best tenants for this space. And, and I would probably suggest that the best doesn't just mean the most money. Uh, it means, because that's short-sighted to just take the, the biggest dollar amount instead of actually finding somebody who's going to care for the property because wear and tear will, will even if you make another hundred bucks a month uh, from let's say a, a student versus uh, less from a family, the wear and tear potentially on the building um, would knock out any gains that you would make. And so I think she's looking for the, the right tenant. Um, and so, you know, I think she's, she's thought about having block parties to allow the neighborhood to meet who's going to be residing here. And to me, it was, I mean, it was a very creative idea. And I think that can help, even if it is students, um, there's something about looking in somebody else's face and understanding that there are families living here, or if there's a problem to, to call and it takes away, it dispels some of the fear of the unknown. And so that's one of the suggestions. I don't know. I mean, we could think about how to make that a condition. I think it's an effort. Maybe nobody shows up, but at least it's an effort. And then, and then, Lastly, um, Mathena's she reached out to the Department of Public Works to find out about sidewalks and speed bumps. They were relatively supportive, I'd say. And Mathena, I'll turn it over to you in a minute to um, see if you've got uh, anything else to say. But um, they, we then suggested she go and talk to the police department and fire department because of emergency response and and putting um, speed bumps on the public way it takes a little bit more than Mathena could do, but she'd be happy to spearhead some endeavor with the neighborhood to try to get either or both of those things to happen. And so, you know, again, I, I keep saying Mathena, but that's what you, that's who you're issuing this approval to. It's Mathena and her dad, both local folks um, who you know, grow up, grew up and now her dad lives in Amherst. 
and is going to manage this property. So, Mathena, I'll turn it over to you. I don't know if there's anything I skipped over or you want to add, but that's, uh, Mr. Chair, just a high level view. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. Ms. Messina, um, or Ms. Morrissey, <laughs> please give us your name and address for the record, please. Sure, Mathena Morrissey, 23 Blackberry Lane in Amherst. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Tom. I think that's a great summary. Uh, just to add a little bit more color and context here. Um, so in terms of the block party, again, this is kind of dependent on if students are to live there. Um, and so it's not necessarily a guarantee. Um, but in my personal experience, uh, I grew up in the Blackberry Grantwood neighborhood where there were a mix of student and um, families. And so we actually did that in this neighborhood. Um, and it basically allowed all of the different parties living in the neighborhood to integrate, get to know each other. Um, we used to have, so the UMass um, housing department, I spoke to them. They say that they actually handle situations like this all the time. They offer um, a good neighbor grant, which is basically a $500 stipend to um, host a block party. We used to have um, the cops come. So we spoke to the officer that used to do our neighborhood, Officer Laramie, um, and he you know, was happy to do this again, should students be the tenants, but it really gave everyone a great opportunity to connect, exchange phone numbers and set expectations for the year. Um, so again, that is only if there are to be students, but it was a very successful thing in my neighborhood growing up. Um, and then second on the speed bumps, again, these are a little bit above, uh, beyond my control, but I did speak to um, the fire department and the engineering department at the DPW. Um, and it sounds like as a next step, it, uh, it makes the most sense to reach out to the transportation advisory committee. Um, so I'm happy to lead the charge on that. Thank you, Ms. Morrissey. Anything else from the, um, the applicants? We're right I don't think so, Mr. Chair. I mean, it's, it's uh, as I said, it's a standard non-owner occupied two family granted to Mathena with her, her dad managing um, that expires upon change of ownership. And if the board is inclined to put a review of the compliance, let's say a year from CO, you know, I think that'd be acceptable to, to Mathena. Great. So we're, we're looking at 726. Um, why don't we take our traditional five minute break and we can come back right around 731. Great, we're gonna have time for board questions and then public comments. Thank you.
All right, we're back. Um, Mr. Reed and Ms. Morrissey, you've completed your presentation. Yes, Mr. Chair. It's time for any questions from board members for the applicant before we move to public comments. All right, no questions from board members from the applicants. Time for public comment. Um, the public speaks at the uh, discretion of the, with the permission of the chair. We're going to ask you to keep your comments to about uh, three minutes. I'm going to start a timer here to help you keep to that time limit. Um, when you are recognized, please give your name and address for the records. Uh, address your comments to the board and not to individuals. And we can start with the, uh, the first person who wishes to comment. And Jacinta, will you bring on Mr. Benjamin Bailey? Sure, the first person is Jamie, I believe. They had their hand up first. Okay, first person, whoever it is. Uh, hello, Mr. Chair. Uh, um, do you want the camera on or do you not care? That's fine, put your camera okay. on. I don't think it'll um, work though, I think we just, we just get voice. Okay, um, I just, uh, at the start of each ZBA meeting, sorry, James Sweeting, uh, 179 North Whitney Street, a butter across the road. Um, at the start of each ZBA meeting, uh, the chair uh, talks about promoting the health, safety and convenience of residents of Amherst. Uh, you've heard from many, many neighbours of our concern in this regard. Um, I'd like to particularly draw attention to uh, children, uh, elderly people, disabled people and special needs people who live within close proximity of this property, uh, adding a 10 uh, lane height, sorry, not a highway, a, a parking lot in uh, uh, across the road uh, it is not going to solve that. You're going to have people coming in and out of that that lot. So I think knowingly approving a special permit, which would result in activities which would potentially jeopardize uh, this seems in direct conflict of your stated responsibilities as the board. Um, I'm concerned about noise issues, but I don't have time to go into them. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about uh, a change of character of the neighborhood. Uh, if this special permit is allowed as a non-owner occupied, uh, the petitioner claims to live in Amherst, uh, but we know she lives in New York City. If she lives in Amherst, she can live in the, the in the house and come and ask as an owner occupied. Um, I'd like you've seen the petition from all of us, the many letters. This is the fifth or sixth meeting that I've had to attend on this. Uh, if we're talking about convenience, this is not convenient. Um, uh, I feel like we're pricing out families in this town by approving things like this, and this continues to hurt our schools. Um, so in my opinion, if you should approve this special permit, it would go against the, the wishes of the families in the neighborhood in favor of a New York City resident who's looking to develop student housing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Anatera. Uh, who's up next, Jacinta? Benjamin Bailey. Mr. Bailey, please give us your name and address for the record. Mr. Bailey, you're muted. Can there you go. go. Now we can't give you Please no. give us your name and address for the record. My name is Benjamin Bailey. I live at 165 North Whitney Street, diagonally across the street from 180 North Whitney. I've lived here for 23 years. 58 people from up and down North Whitney Street and Redgate Lane and High Street have signed a petition opposing the special permit to convert the single family home at 180 North Whitney to a non-owner occupied duplex. Signers have included the abutters up the street a butters across the street, a butters down the street, and a butters from behind the house. These signers and neighbors have lived here for 10, 20, 30, 40, and more years. We are unanimous in finding that an eight bedroom, non-owner occupied duplex at 180 North Whitney is not in character with the neighborhood and would degrade the neighborhood. We already know that non-owner occupation, non occupation on our street has this effect. 
when 174 North Whitney, the house next door to 180 North Whitney, went from owner-occupied to non-owner occupied in 2018, it created numerous quality of life issues for the neighborhood. No management plan can, can fix this. It harmed us. Ms. Schwartz described these eloquently in the first public comment at the first meeting. The owner-occupied versus non-owner-occupied distinction makes all the difference in the world. If uh, Ms. Morissette were living there, I'm sure it would be fine, as Jamie Sweeting just said. The fact that you can't have this non-owner-occupied uh, duplex by right is reflected in the zoning laws. Although I don't see 180 North Whitney Street is currently for rent, the owner did list it for 4,400 a month in the spring and early summer. This makes it clear the owner is aiming for student renters. No one else rents a small house in Amherst for 4,400 a month. Ms. Morrissey would have every right to rent to students and the economics of investment properties means she will in fact rent to students. I'm a landlord myself and the economic pressures are enormous to rent to UMass undergrads. Eight students at that property would rob the butters and the neighborhood of our quality of life. The people who know this neighborhood and care about it the most are unanimously opposed to allowing this house to become a non-owner occupied duplex. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Um, Ms. Williams. Nancy Schwartz. Ms. Schwartz, could you give us your name and address for the record, please? All right, I believe I'm not on mute now. Yep, you're, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm not sure if I'll be as eloquent as maybe I was that Benjamin Bailey was referring to, but I am uh, I'm a butter. I live at 153 High Street. We own and occupy an owner occupied two family. We've been here for 32 years. I mean, I, I think I said last meeting, uh, my fears of a non owner occupied unit. And I don't need to go into all the details about uncontrolled noise and those things. I, I do have some questions for the board as to what criteria do you use when you determine to give a permit for a non-owner occupied two family versus an owner occupied two family? I, I would like to I would like to know how how you take into account uh, those two choices. I would also ask that if any permit is given, that all abutters be given directly a direct phone number to the person who is managing the property so that we can reach them at all hours of the day and night if there's a problem with noise and parties and loud conversations at 2 to 4 a.m. My last point is about the property adjacent to them, right in back of my house at 174 North Whitney. It had been an owner-occupied three-family up until it was sold in 2018. At that point, there was never a special permit or no kind of hearings, and it is now a non-owner-occupied three-family. I would like to understand how that change of classification happened with a change of ownership, and there was no hearing, there was no public notification, and if, if things fall through the cracks like that, couldn't it also happen at 180 North Whitney Street with a change in ownership? So I'll just end my, end my comments with that, and I really thank all of you for uh, listening to us. Thank you very much, Ms. Schwartz. Um, Ms. Williams. Who's Amy next? Sweeting should be entering shortly. Um, hi, hi. Can you hear me? We can. Just give us your name and address. For um, the yeah, I, I spoke at length at the at the very first meeting, so I'm not going to go back into all the things we've talked about about Amy, safety Sweeting, and noise. Sweeting, just just start and, with um, your, your name, just start with your name and address, please. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can, but I just want you to start with your name and address for the record, please. I'm sorry. Can you... Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I just want to just reiterate the I the the 
point about the character of the neighborhood. We live, uh, again, Amy Sweeting, 179 North Whitney Street. My husband spoke earlier. We live right across the street. And since this began, every day when I walk out the front door of my house and I look across the street and I imagine, and I thought it was going to be an eight car parking lot. Now we're talking about a 10 car parking lot and other cars potentially on the street. It just breaks my heart. This is a neighborhood of little kids, families, um, and just changing that, changing that property to a, you know, it's it's called a two family, two duplex, but it will be an eight student dormitory with 10, a 10 car parking lot, just irreversibly changes the character of this part of the street. And we've talked about, you know, the ability to put in um, qualifications that there needs to be a review of compliance and we can check in and see how it's gone. And it doesn't matter how it's gone once this goes ahead, because it's irreversible. It's never going back. If it's sold to someone else, it will be sold to someone else as a student dormitory with a parking lot. So I just feel like, you know, if if it, if it stays how it is and it gets rented to four students, that's fine. And we would like, you know, we'd obviously like there to be conditions and hopefully there'll be good neighbors, but it could go back to a single family home one day. But the with the with if this permit goes ahead and this construction goes ahead, it will never go back to a family home. And I just want to add one more thing we talked about. Um, you talked about that um, the petitioner has talked to the the town about getting sidewalks put in and calming. Our children, who are now in their 20s, grew up here and walked across the street and down Skilling's Path to school for, you know, 10, however many years. And we were always worried about them coming out of Skilling's Path onto the, our street where there was no sidewalk on that side of the street. And we asked the town multiple times about putting in a sidewalk there and making it safer for the people that come out of Skilling's Path. And they, I believe one time they put some mulch down on the road, but there, I just don't think, you know, we've been asking for over a decade for a sidewalk over there. So it is, it is already a dicey spot to come out of the woods there. And just to reiterate all the safety things that people have talked about with the more, more cars and cars going in and out of that parking lot, I just would encourage you to remember that. And just to really remember that our concerns about that Benjamin spoke much more eloquently about, about the character of this neighborhood that we all bought into and raised our children in and love this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sweeting. Um, Ms. Williams, who's next? Andrew Spielvogel. Sorry about that. That was me. I don't know why my timer is doing that. Hold on, I'm sorry. All right, that's my, my technical mistake there. All right, Mr. Spielvogel, please uh, give your name and address for the record and I'll try to time you quietly. Hi, my name is Andrew Spielvogel. I live at 33 Redgate Lane, just up the street. And I guess, um, when we bought our house, uh, bought into this neighborhood, we did so because it's a very quiet family, uh, family oriented neighborhood. It is zoned as a single family neighborhood. And we made the reasonable assumption that the neighborhood would continue to be single family homes. Um, I used the language reasonable assumption specifically because that was a phrase that was used by a ZBA board member at a previous meeting when talking about the reasonable assumption that a house would be built on a flag lot. I think that language is applicable here as well. When buying a house, in, when buying our house into a single family neighborhood, we also made a reasonable assumption that the houses would continue to be zoned as single family homes or non or owner occupied uh, multifamily homes. Um, I think that having a converted multifamily, um, not owner occupied investment property in our neighborhood is out of character with the neighborhood. And it's also against the zoning. And that's why they need a special permit. Um, there are many issues that we've, that have been highlighted in the many letters um, having to do with added traffic, the blind corner, safety, parking, general noise issues, which are doc documented throughout Amherst and non-owner occupied rentals. Um, I guess one other thing with the increased parking lot, are there n any guidelines like just blacktopping a massive amount of space 
a part of your yard that used to be grass. Are there no issues with like permeability and water runoff associated with that? The additional blacktop. Um, I guess another point, I, another question I ask myself is what is the point of zoning if an out of state owner can buy a property, convert it to a two family and immediately rent it out all against the wishes of an entire neighborhood. Um, and ultimately, when there are issues with this property, it is not the out-of-state owner or her father who, who manages it who have to deal with the repercussions. It's our neighborhood. Um, I guess one last part is um, I feel like by um, approving this non-owner occupied multifamily permit, you would be kind of setting a precedent for single family conversions into multifamily non-owner occupied rentals in single family neighborhoods. And I think that this would continue to drive, to price out the full-time community that makes Amherst such a great place to live. Investors will slowly buy up the single homes. And I don't know about other members of the neighborhood, but I get mailers from investors wanting to buy our house multiple times a month. Um, and I guess my last point, if we're going to make so many investments in our school systems, the public library and other infrastructure in Amherst, shouldn't we also protect the neighborhoods where the residents who will use those resources live? Thank you, I yield. Thank you, Mr. Spielberg. Um, Ms. Winters, or Ms. Williams, please give us the next person. Um, Yoav Ilovensky. Mr. Elovinsky, you're um, you're muted right now. There okay, you thank you, thank you. My name is Yo Avelinevsky. I live in Eleven Redgate Lane, and I thank you for this hearing. The chair read the mission statement of this board at the beginning of the meeting. I humbly want to repeat it. The zoning board operates for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst, period. Every single purpose listed here will be impacted negatively by this proposal. More traffic, more pollution, more noise, greater dangers to cars and walkers since the house is adjacent to a dangerous blind curve, and we can go on. Every neighbor knows it, and every zoning board member should know it by now. An approval of this proposal by the board, which will turn the property into a student dorm structure, will be a violation of the mission of this board, as well as a violation of a democratic principle, because clearly the neighborhood while welcoming a new family to join us, is overwhelmingly, if not totally, opposed to this proposal. Moreover, because such a prop an approval will violate the mission of this board, it will also be a violation of the public trust in the board. If an accident occur, again, since we, we witnessed a number of accidents at this curve in the past, and someone get hurt, because of the student parking on the street, it will be because of your grave error in judgment. Let's not get there. 10 parking spaces will turn a nice backyard into a cement to asphalt space. How healthy that will be. Shame of you if you will make this negative transformation. Block party or speed bumps is a joke. It will make no difference to the big issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Alabinski. Uh, Mary Anderson. Thank you. Ms. Anderson, give us your name and address for the record, please. Ms. Anderson. Oh, there it is. I had to hit the unmute. Okay. Mary Anderson, I own the property at 191 North Whitney Street, so I'm 
across the street from the property and Sigerling's path seems to empty on directly onto my driveway in some people's way of thinking. Anyway, so that's always been a problem. I am, I join everyone. I, I hate to follow you off. That was such an eloquent, everything I would have said, he said better. So we'll skip that and not bore you. But here's the other thing. Once you do this, it's like dominoes. You can't go back from this. And so what happens is someone else decides, well, what the hell I'm going to add on or I'm going to, and, and pretty soon you destroyed the neighborhood. That's exactly how it occurs. And I, I would recommend that since everybody's main objection seems to be traffic, you do two things. One, you'll have to red paint the area there so that nobody can stop and park there. And that'll eliminate the parking problem. And it's inconvenient for the residents. This is true. I apologize for that. But the other thing is, is you need to declare a moratorium on these kinds of things until the town can get their act together and put in appropriate streets and sidewalks. At least there's a sidewalk on North Whitney Street. <clears throat> there's not even a sidewalk on Redgate Lane. And I know that some people live in this fantasy that Amherst is gonna turn into Switzerland and everybody's gonna be on foot and oh, won't it be lovely carrying their baguettes? No, it won't and it's never going to happen. So you at the very least, need sidewalks since well, in the, one of the selling points is the proximity for walking to the university. And nothing should be done until the town fixes the infrastructure to accommodate the outrageous number of vehicles that are now allowed to come into this town because the university refused to take responsibility and cap its enrollment, which is another story. But I, I'm opposed to this as you can tell, for all the reasons everybody else said. Okay, I'm done. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. <clears throat> Is there anybody no. else? No, Give well, wait, else. hold on. Oh. One more person. Let's just give it a second. Okay. Um, Julia, I apologize. Julia R. is going to join us. I'm gonna let her pronounce her last name. Okay. Um, my name is Julia Rushmeyer. I am a, an abutter, I guess. I live across the street at 165 North Whitney Street. Um, a couple of things. I, I'm not going to read everything because we've had some really great people articulating all the arguments here. But I want, I want to point out, I'm an attorney. We have a presumption here. There's a presumption that this is not allowed. Right. So if you're going to rebut that presumption, you have to have a really good reason of why this is going to make the neighborhood better, why this is going to make the neighborhood more harmonious, why this is something that's going to be very beneficial to the town of Amherst and to the in-town area of this neighborhood. I haven't heard one argument about why this presumption should be rebutted. And someone can correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't heard any advantages for all your criteria that you list here about the harmonious relationship, the character of the town. It's going to be better for traffic. None of that, right? It's all going to be worse and under all those categories. So legally speaking, I'm just not sure I've heard any legal rationale. And certainly that's the underpinning of, of the zoning bylaws, right? The legal part of it. Um, Secondly, we have schools. The two biggest schools in our whole town are yards, you know, a couple hundred yards away from this location. Why is that a good location for students? This is for for kids. You're, you're, and Wildwood's there now too. You know, it won't be an elementary school for very long, but that's there are hundreds and hundreds of kids all in this neighborhood that are going to these two schools. It's a perfect family neighborhood. And in fact, it's one of the few affordable family neighborhoods re still remaining in town. Um, so I think that's important to consider the the character of the neighborhood is also that it's, it's the vicinity of the schools. Um, finally, I guess I would just say, you know, 58 people signed this petition. Have you, I mean, I don't know, how often have you gotten that many people who are this upset about a development? And if you're, if you're, you know, when would you not approve a development like this? Like what, I can't even imagine in another circumstance where it would be so many people opposed, <laughs> such not in the character of the neighborhood. Um, so yeah, that, that's just kind of puzzling me. And it just, I urge you to keep that in mind 
you know, if you if you approve uh, this one, it just seems like there's absolutely no safeguards at all and no reason for us to have a zoning bylaw with these presumptions against this. And the owner's certainly welcome to live there and, and rent it out and do that that way. But the presumption is against this. So show me another circumstance <laughs> where, you, where, you know, you would approve this um, or not approve this. I'd, I'd be very curious. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Rochemeyer. Elena Davis. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, can, Ms. Davis. Can we get your name and address for the record? Sure. It's actually Elena Davis. I live at 20 Clifton Ave, which is basically my property is on the corner of Whitney, North Whitney Street. So I walk up and down the street every day. Um, I, I don't want to repeat all of the very eloquent points that um, all of my neighbors have made. I think I just wanted to throw in, um, you know, a, a note that I empathize with the buyer in this whole situation. Um, you know, I imagine that this seemed like really a wonderful opportunity at the outset. You know, I think the plans that were drawn up were very well done. You know, it looked like a beautiful plan. Um, and I'm sorry that she didn't have a chance to you know, walk around the neighborhood before the purchase and talk to some of the neighbors um, about how such a proposal would go over, you know, with everyone living surrounding this property. Um, it's nothing personal. Again, I, I think that I, I'm sure she had the best intentions and I appreciate her, um, you know, enterprise, but clearly there are, um, enormous number of reasons why this is just not the right property for this kind of a, um, of a project. I'm not going to repeat all of the points that others said, but I'm, I'm sorry for the buyer that, you know, she's not hearing a lot of hopeful comments from people. Um, but we really are very um, protective of our, of our neighborhood. Um, you know, we all purchased homes expecting it um, to remain as it was. And, um, you know, I'm sorry for her, but this is just not the right place for this kind of a project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Do you have other people who wish to speak? Those other members of the public who wish to speak, uh, do so now. So indicate by raising, using the raised hand function on your computer. I'm not seeing any additional hands. Neither am I. All right. We'll close off public comments. And the next order is for uh, the opportunity for the applicant to respond to the public comments. And then we'll go to the opportunity for board members to ask questions either solicit, uh, elicited by the comments or on questions that they have on their own. So Mr. Reedy or Ms. Morrissey, do um, you wish to respond? Yeah, and maybe just a, a, a few of them that I'd like to get a little bit of a sense of the board. Uh, I've been doing this a while, so I'd, I'd like to get a little bit of a sense. But, um, you know, fundamentally, uh, I think uh, Attorney Ruchmeyer had mentioned rebuttable presumptions. And unfortunately, that's not how this process does work oftentimes in law, as you know. There are presumptions that need to be overcome, burdens of proof, et cetera special permit here is it's an allowed use folks had said and i think it was mr uh spielvogel had said it's it's against zoning and that's why we need a special permit in fact it's allowed by zoning the the medium is through a special permit and I, i'm talking technically a little bit that's if this was a owner occupied two family uh i think to miss schwartz question uh we wouldn't even be in front of the zoning board of appeals we would be in front of the planning board through site plan review, and they have a section 11 that they go through uh, to see if it's compliant and, and it is concerned more with site design versus, as you know, 10.38 Zoning Board of Appeals special permit deals really with the, the use of the use. And there is discretion for the board, right? So I'm not saying uh, there is, you have to give it. That's where the special permit comes in. If it was against zoning, we would either not be in front of you or we'd be in front of you in the context of a variance, which 
we don't even have to get into that, you know, specific use variances aren't allowed in, in town. So just somewhat fundamentally is what are you doing? You're granting a special permit, which, or, you know, we're asking you to grant a special permit, which uh, is an allowed use in this zoning district for not owner occupied two family dwellings. Um, a couple of responses as to the, the, the for the site plan, uh, there is stormwater management, you know, and in, in we're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place because we're trying to provide a, a, a sufficient on-site parking. Um, and even with that parking, uh, we are looking to increase the uh, lot coverage. It's 29%, 40% is what is allowed in this zoning district. With all of what we're proposing, we're under 30%. So, you know, again, this is an oversized lot could have additional building area it that's not what we're proposing you know we're just we're proposing a, a non-owner occupied uh, two-family dwelling um as far as benefits i think additional housing is probably the biggest benefit and sometimes it goes without saying because it's relatively self-evident but i mean we're in a housing crisis and providing additional housing period is providing additional housing uh if it's student housing well, that those are students that are that might have a, a, instead of going into a single family home somewhere or, or somewhere else, they're they're living they're going to live here, and that opens up housing for fam. Like housing is housing is housing, um, and so this does provide housing and provides additional taxes because the assessment's going to be higher. And you know, again, if if the neighborhood does want to fundamentally change what could go here, I think there is a remedy, and it's through the town council. Uh, through zoning, maybe a zoning map amendment to reclassify part of this zoning district as a neighborhood residence um, or, you know, a different zoning district. Uh, but but that's really, you know, to, to put it on the Zoning Board of Appeals to act as that arbiter, you're really just facing the fact of what the zoning bylaw, which has been passed through the legislative, you know, at that time town meeting, now town council, um, you're just looking to abide by those rules as are we uh and not necessarily create them so you know kind of high level responses uh and then maybe lastly uh i'll say call jim so if somebody asked uh if they could have his number uh yes i think whoever the manager is jim here he would give the number if there is an issue at 2 a.m call him and i don't know if maybe jim if you want to talk a little bit about managing properties um because again i can appreciate um what the what the neighbors are saying and, and just before you go Jim let me show one uh screen just to show these are um non-owner occupied so the purple is the subject property the the blue highlighted are non-owner occupied uh residential dwelling units within a thousand feet of the property and so you know, and there's different categories. You can look at the GIS system, two family, three family, rental permits, right? We could look up rental permits and see, um, you know, what we're dealing with there. So now I'm just going to go to rental permits and you can see this is what's in the neighborhood. There, there are rentals, you know, right across Skillings Trail. There's a rental. Diagonal, there's a rental. Next to there are rentals. So it's not like, you know, when we're talking about the neighborhood, the, the folks out of this whole area, because this is a pretty dense area, who have come out. And I know they say 58 have signed the uh, the letter. And I know there's a lot here. And, and Mathena's listening. Um, I just want to make sure that the characterization of the neighborhood does also take into consideration. Oh, sorry, I hit the wrong thing. Take into consideration um, what's happening on the ground and that there are a lot of rentals there. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. And Jim, I'll, I'll let you go. Hey, thank you for having me. Jim Morrissey, 23 Blackberry Lane, Amherst, Mass. Um, yeah, I, you know, thank you, Tom. I, I, I think that was great because, you know, I mean, I've heard a lot tonight from the residents and uh, it tends to be negative. It's emotional. Um, it's opinion based. And, uh, you know, it's overlooking, you know, uh, data and facts. Uh, if you even go a little bit further down North Whitney, there's a very large development um, owned by a friend of mine who manages it very, very well of non-owner occupied multifamily housing. How many units, but it's in excess of 30. So, you know, with that said, um, you know, I believe in, in management philosophy 
Okay. Uh, number one, this is my daughter's property. It's her investment. Okay. Uh, and she loves architecture ever since she was a kid, loves building, all those sorts of things. So, you know, uh, bought the house, we'll fix it up, we'll add on to it, and we'll manage it as property. Okay. Um, you know, uh, uh, I live five minutes down the road. Okay. If people want my phone number, I will gladly give it to them. They can call me at 2 a.m. Because, you know, if you have a well-designed, well-built, nice property, okay, you will get good tenants, all right? And in order to reinforce that, um, you you do your background checks, okay? You vet who you're going to rent to, right? This is our house, our investment, our property, and we care a lot about our investments in our property. We're not going to turn it over to people who are going to abuse it. And we don't want to be the people who move into the neighborhood and trash the place. Okay. I mean, uh, it, so, you know, um, I know I'm a little bit of emotional, but I, I sat and I listened to a lot of people make various assumptions, people who do not know me, they don't know the way I operate. I'm friendly, I'm available. I run a tight ship when it comes to management. I have professional experience in facilities management, commercial property uh, development and management, and residential property development and management. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's not difficult to have a well managed property that is not a nuisance to the neighborhood and is not a nuisance to all the residents. Um, and I'll back that up by giving my phone number to everybody. You know, that's fine. I will drive by there every single day on my way home from work. All right. If I have to, um, I, I will be extraordinarily responsive to the tenants. I'll be extraordinarily responsible to the neighborhood. I'll be extraordinarily responsible to my daughter on this. And, you know, integration again, uh, you know, and on Blackberry, when they started those block there, uh, those block parties. All right. Everyone's like, well, nobody will show up. You'll try it anyway. Well, guess what? Everybody showed up, you know, and people brought cookies and they had face to faces and they, you know, got to know each other. Uh, the, the police were there. They they laid it down. Uh, the neighbors laid down their concerns. And all of a sudden there were no cars parked on the street within, you know, uh, uh, two years of these. Things. Uh, there were no more noise complaints. People turned their music down by 10 o'clock. Um, and all those problems that were, quote unquote, ruining the neighborhood, destroying Amherst and all that, they disappeared through good, clear, honest communication and integration. You know, when people get to know each other, right, uh, they're, they're less likely to be negligent in their behavior around those people. That's been my experience dealing with people in, in a management environment. So I would continue to do exactly that. Um, I uh, so. Um, I guess that's uh, that's my case. Okay, I'm the local guy. I'm here. I know what I'm doing. I'll run a tight ship. Um, like I said, I'll give my phone number out there. And, you know, if you want to put a condition and review this thing a year after CFO, fine. I mean, that's fair. Huh? You know, we'll walk the walk. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Marcy. Thank you, Tim. You're welcome. Um, any other comments from or responses from the applicant before we move to board questions? I guess I have a couple of quick questions. Um, so I'm looking, I don't, I don't seem to have a complaint response form in front of me. I may have misplaced it. Um, Ms. Williams, do we have a complaint response form from the applicant? I believe we do. One second. So we, why don't you pull that up? So you would be, just to clarify, you'd be happy with a condition that said that um, you'd give your number um, for contact by any neighbor who's concerned about a, a complaint, all right? Um, so that may be um, a condition we would think about. Secondly, um, I would, would you be willing to, I think you'd have to be willing to accept a condition that you participate in the rental the residential rental program, the approval program, right? Uh, because that's not a condition that's listed. Secondly, uh, what about the provision that we attend, uh, attach to many um, rental properties, and we're trying to do it consistently, but that you keep a list, a log of complaints, that those complaints be submitted to the building, to the town, that upon annual 
um, renewal of your rental property, those conditions, those uh, complaints are listed and, uh, and turned into the town along with the, the resident. Okay, so we need to get that language. If that's something I think you'd be, you'd, be, you'd approve that. Um, I guess those are the questions. So that's something you would do, you would approve with. Yeah, those are all, I mean, those are all acceptable, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right. Other questions from members of the board for the applicant? Yeah, just run through that. I, I just misplaced it. Thank you, Ms. Williams. I appreciate that. So property owners, just scroll down a little bit farther. Is that your number there, uh, the, the 439? I, I, I don't want to give out your number to the whole public, Mr. Morrissey, but, but it's, it's a file document. Is that your number? That's my number. That's your number. All right. Yeah. And that's Jim's number right there. Okay. So it's on the list. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions from board members? Mr. Henry, I see your hands up. Mr. White was first. Who, oh, Mr. White. Yep. Yeah, you're fading into the books on the, on the left hand, upper left hand side. Go ahead. Hey, we'll get there eventually. It's fine. Um, <clears throat> No, my question would be, I know that there was some speaking the management plan and also tonight about, you know, a block party. Um, if this request were to be approved, my question is more along the lines of what action, if any, um, has been taken thus far to speak with the neighborhood, to speak with the members of the neighborhood and to, you know, try to address any sort of issues that they've had. Dean, I'll let you take that one. Um, sure. So actually back in June, when um, I had heard about some of the neighborhood responses, I did reach out to the organizer um, to try and speak about, you know, my intentions and everything. Um, and he was not open to a conversation. Um, and so I wasn't able to really push that forward. Um, so you know, I'm happy to talk to any of the neighbors. I'm happy to have those conversations should they, um, you know, be open to them. But given they were so, so closed off, all I could really do was go ahead and, you know, think of a block party and speed bumps and guest policy and all of those things that were in my control. Thank you, Mr. White. Uh, Mr. Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we've heard a lot from the neighbors about preserving the character of the neighborhood. And, and thank you, Mr. Reedy, for that map. Um, can anyone, either from the applicants or town staff, advise if this neighborhood has an HOA? It's not. I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Uh... This neighborhood doesn't have an HOA because it's not set up that way. It would be set up that way if it were a condo association or possibly a subdivision. But this is an old neighborhood that's been around for, you know, 100 years or more. And so it's not typical that it would have an HOA. If it did, I'd be very surprised. And I, th I thought so. And, and the other question is, um, even months before today, a lot of conversation has been about traffic safety and I, I heard someone say today that we shouldn't grant this permit until the town does something about traffic and um has can the can anyone from the town advise if any of these neighbors um have gone to this city hall or town hall to actually petition that the sidewalk that everyone is so strong about to have the sidewalk built or petition the town to do anything about traffic in this neighborhood. Because a big concern here has been that there's traffic or this is gonna create more traffic hazards and there's no sidewalk. So is there anything in that we have to suggest that the neighbors have voiced that concern to the authorities other than to the petitioners? Ms. Brestrup. 
Um, we would have to ask the Department of Public Works, but those um, comments and requests tend to come in sort of, um, I won't say haphazardly, but it, it isn't something that's necessarily tracked. So they may have made suggestions or requests over the years, but I don't think that um, there would be a clear uh, record of those complaints and requests. I would add, Mr. Henry, that there was one public comment that referred to um, a request of City Hall to, for a sidewalk. I don't know when that request was made. I don't think there was a date given. And they said the response had been to put some um, mulch down. That was tonight, and but that's the extent of what I heard from the public comments was that there at least was one person who talked to City Hall, but I don't know when that was and, and how, how uh, concerted an effort that was. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, questions from board members? Mr. White, did you get the chance to ask all your questions? Yep. Okay. Mr. Meadows. I think Mr. Reedy was looking for something he suggested a little bit earlier. And uh, I think to accede to his request, I will say that I, I, I went over there before the meeting walked there, even though I've walked on that hundreds of times on that street and skillings path, it is not a safe location to put additional students. And I will not vote for this. So I know you were looking for that. There's the comment I'll give you. Thank you. Um, if there are no other questions, comments from members of the board, I would entertain a motion that we keep open the public hearing, but we move to the public meeting so we can discuss conditions, deliberate on this matter, and allow the board to discuss amongst ourselves our, our feelings about this property, about this application. So um, I would entertain such a motion that we move to a public meeting while keeping the public hearing open. So, so moved. <laughs> we, everybody wants to do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I'll take that as a second because there were three moves. So uh, any discussion on the motion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to move to public hearing, public meeting while we keep the public hearing open. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Great. So what I'd like to do is to start this is I, I just like to give some context and try to provide a little bit of background and balance. The ZBA is empowered to make decisions to allow um, a use or a, or a building that would not otherwise be allowed but for the public special permit. It is in and of itself discretionary. That is the, the first thing. The second thing is we can allow those, and we are and we do allow special permits quite frequently, but when we allow those special permits, we often condition them. And I do remember Mr. Parent talking about the benefits of, of conditions. One thing about the special permit is that it allows us to create conditions that ameliorate and mitigate problems that the neighbors and the community may face or concerns that we have about the property. And so in this case, a single family, that home can stay there, could be rented out to students, and it could have, um, and there wouldn't be any protection in terms of getting the landlord's number, having a complaint response, other kinds of things that, may, that we may want to impose upon that property, um, but for the special permit. The special permit allows us to either forestall or to correct problem properties in a way that um, only can be done through the conditions of a special permit. That's the benefit of the special permit for the ZBA. And that's an important benefit and important uh, authority that the ZBA has. And that's one of the decisions we have to make is, can we permit this? It, can we fulfill our obligation, which is to make the findings we have to make under 10.38 and to live into the, and to comply with the, the, um, the, the tenor and the general uh, nature of the the uh, mandate of the ZBA to provide for the 
safety and health and of the town of Amherst. So that's one side. The other side is we have a we really have to make those findings. We have to be able to make the findings that um, that is required in 10.38, and we have to make findings that are just the general responsibilities of the of the ZBA. One of those is our purpose is a special permit review process is intended to ensure a harmonious relationship between the proposed development and its surrounding and ensure that proposals are consistent with the purpose and intent of this bylaw. That's the general admonition to the ZBA. So that gives us you know, the balancing we have to do. Secondly, we have to make findings under 10.38 and 10.380, 10.382, 10.385 in particular, I think are app or raise real questions uh, about this application and make it hard for me to look at this application and make those findings, um, which they deal with suitability in the neighborhood, deal with uh, not constituting a nuisance of air, water, pollution, flood, noise, odor, and uh, protects adjoining premises against detrimental or offensive units, uh, uses. So what we have is, is there a way, generally, we try to find a way to condition the application so that we can make those findings. That's why I, I when I do the committee to the, uh, the agenda, I like to do conditions first that then allow us to make the findings that we have to make. But I don't know that we can do, I'm not sure, and I don't think we can make those conditions that will allow us to make those findings consistent with 10.38. So I'm troubled by this by the application. And this is one of those that I can see a way where actually the community may be better off with a, with a special permit. The neighborhood may be better off because they'll have more access to um, rental property, the, the manager, they'll be able to be able to put conditions on hum, um, the noise levels and, and lighting and everything else. It may, be it may be better off, but if this special permit isn't offered, those things go with those protections for the neighborhood go away. So I think I think that's the balancing act that we have to make. I tend to come down in this case that I think is very difficult to make such a, a special permit uh, decision and to approve it. But I'd like to hear what other people have to say before I um, before we go further. Mr. Sloviter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to explain my decision about this application in greater detail than a simple yes or no vote on the motion. I think that everyone concerned with this application deserves an explanation. This is the opportunity during the public meeting. I prepared these comments shortly before tonight's meeting to be sure I am clear and don't forget anything. I've heard nothing this evening to change my view. I have read everything I have received about this application since it was brought before the ZBA, both from the applicant and the interested members of the community. I attended the site visit, looked closely at the surrounding neighborhood and attended all of the hearings. I returned twice at different times of the day to see what life on the street is like. I saw dog walkers and even people who walk or run without dogs, if you can imagine such a thing. I have given a lot of thought to the various issues and concerns associated with this application, largely the effect of the proposed project on the neighborhood. In spite of assertions that it is possible that a family could rent the proposed addition, I find that unlikely to the point of it being virtually impossible. For everything I have seen in the rental market in Amherst, I consider it exceedingly unlikely that a family would choose to pay $4,000 a month or more to live in a unit that is attached to one occupied by four college students. Therefore, it is essentially certain that this property will have at least eight college students living on it. There is clear data that shows that non-owner-occupied multifamily dwellings that are occupied entirely by college students have a greatly increased incidence of becoming nuisance properties. We have seen too many examples of this. The noise, trash, traffic gatherings, and late night disturbances that are often present at, the, at those properties adversely affect the neighborhoods where they are located. 
if this neighborhood was already dominated by those kinds of properties, as some streets near the university are, then it might be a different case. But this neighborhood is nowhere near that point and needs to be protected. My decision is not about students, housing, judgments about 20 year olds, or anything other than the effect on the existing quality of life in the neighborhood with a non on, on a non-owner occupied property with eight or more students and 10 parking spaces. It is about the aspects of what makes a place a welcoming, enjoyable place to live as the residents of this neighborhood have clearly claimed it to be. Feeling unsafe is not welcoming and enjoyable. Neither is noise, congestion, disturbances, and all of the other problems that this proposal is likely to bring. The number of cars and people that are almost certain to congregate on this lovely property in nice weather will likely change the nature of the neighborhood for the worse. A significant part of this board's mandate is that, as Chairman Judge mentioned, is that we find that an application must satisfy findings 10.382, 10.383, and 10.385. If we find that the application does not satisfy those requirements, we are actually directed to reject the application, as far as I understand it. I do not see how this application, in spite of the assurances given by the applicant, can satisfy those required findings. For all of these reasons, I will vote no on this application. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Meadows, I see your hands up. Like Mr. Sloboda, I wanted to further explain my reason for voting no on this. If Mr. Reedy will put up the map again. This afternoon, just before the meeting, I stood in front of this property. I looked up the street, up Redgate, and realized, which I have before, that not too far beyond the property, the next property beyond Skilling's Path, you cannot see going down the slope to the front of the property. It's a blind spot. Too many cars coming out of that property over time means that the children who go up and down Skilling's path to school, to run, and to walk, in addition to the adults that go up and down that street on a constant basis, walking, running, and simply being on the street, are in danger if there are a lot more cars coming out of that property. I, I cannot vote for this because of the safety concerns that I have at that, this moment for that area. Too many cars come speeding down Redgate, which is a, a steep downhill to make that turn right in front of the property. If the property were somewhere else, I might vote differently, but not for this location. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meadows. Uh, Mr. White, you have your hand up. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chair. Um, so I would echo a lot of what Mr. Sloboder and Mr. Meadows said. Um, I'm going to have a very difficult time finding that you know this does meet the project does meet the required findings. Um, I understand and agree that every petition that comes before us should be seen individually and not as part of a whole, but I'm reminded of the multitude of times that we've had the conversation over the year of me being on this board as a full member about neighborhoods that are kind of too far gone uh, with you know no longer being owner-occupied single-family homes, but are now predominantly UMass students with a fair amount of Amherst College as well. Um, I think that this project simply just does not fit with the standing of the current neighborhood. Um, and I think it would be possibly excellent if it were located somewhere else um, in the town. However, 
where it's located. I just don't know that I'm going to be able to approve the findings on this. But thank you. Thank you. Mr. Henry, did you wish to speak? I do, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Um, I, I, I am the dissenting opinion um, with this project. I, I, I think that um, understanding everything that the neighbors have said and with very valid concerns, one of the things that's been very predominant in the feedback is about Amherst and the neighborhood being welcoming and the comments is anything but. Um, it doesn't represent welcoming. Miss Morrissey and her dad is the town of Amherst. Um, the, the purpose of the ZBA is for the welfare of the town of Amherst. So while I appreciate that um, the neighbors have very valid concerns, they're asking us to essentially, again, ignore um, certain parts of the town of Amherst. I, what, what is very difficult for me time after time is hearing the animosity towards college students. We live in a college town. They are part of the community. That is it. It is not going to change. There, there are things that are going to happen. And I am not advocating that we change every neighborhood to accommodate students, but there is a presumption from everything I've heard that the only people that can live in this proposed property are rowdy college students or college students with lots of cars. I have been in neighborhoods where there are graduate students who are focusing on their PhD, who wants a quiet neighborhood to live in, that does not want to be where the rowdy and the loud is. So that assumption was not factored in here. It is almost as if, if you build a two family house, it's going to be rowdy college students. And again, understanding that the major concern and quite frankly, the common theme against this project is traffic. One car speeding down this road is a hazard to anyone walking on the street. So multiple cars being there with safe drivers doesn't mean that one car coming down the curb that Mr. Meadows pointed out cannot be a hazard. I appreciate that 58 people got together to sign the petition. These 58 people should sign the same petition to the town of Amherst, because again, you know, Ms. Marcy owns this property. She could live in this property one day. We're, we're saying to her that, okay, you know, we'll grant you this permit, you know, you should get this permit if you live there, but if you're not gonna live there, we shouldn't do it. It's, I, I, I don't understand it. it. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. If she was living there, it would be fine. But because she's not living there, it is not okay. I, I, I don't get that argument. I, I don't fully appreciate or understand that. So, it is, you know, people talk about, you know, we've paid millions of dollars in taxes. Therefore, we should have this or not have any change. A thousand yards from the map I saw, it's like a thousand yards the neighborhood has already changed, okay? This, this property from the site visit I did, they're not proposing some monstrosity that's gonna alter how the neighborhood looks. They're building something that complements the neighborhood. The only thing that is of grave concern here is who's going to live there. And I find that problematic, I do. It, it is, that, that, is, that is very problematic. It's like, who's going to live there? If, if I hear arguments about, um, well, it's a three-family house or a four-family house, that, those are genuine, legitimate concerns, okay? But that's not what they're asking us to do. We can make the lines. And going back to Mr. Judge's earlier point, I think the community is better having a special permit with these conditions to safeguard some of those concerns that you do have. Because again, the house stands, there's nothing to say that they can, that should they rent this property, that you won't get the tenant from hell living there. <laughs> because again, you know, you're essentially saying you can rent to whomever you want, as is, but if you decide to make a two family house, you know, 
We're very concerned of what's going to happen because it's going to be college kids. They can, it's, I, I, we're, there needs to be some kind of a consistency. And I find that, you know, we, I haven't seen that necessary consistency um, on certain projects. And, and again, um, I, I've lived in different neighborhoods in this town. I live in neighborhoods that had no sidewalks, which I did not like. I live in neighborhoods that have sidewalks. And yes, as someone who lives in a very residential neighborhood, I do appreciate those concerns. And yes, I have mixed feelings because um, I don't want my neighborhood to change. But I also understand that I do not want to encroach in somebody else's right to do what they think is appropriate for their families and their needs. And this is something that is for the Morris's family. And essentially that is that is what we're doing. We are telling this young lady who grew up in the town of Amherst, went to Amherst schools, lives here, and who potentially may one day move back here to say, um, no, you know, we say you were a welcoming neighborhood, but we have we have restrictions, we have conditions. You, we're welcoming as long as you conform to what we say is okay for the neighborhood. And that and that's the part I'm not okay with. If there were if there were genuine, legitimate, logical reasons for denial of this petition, if there was something inherently wrong with what they were trying to do, I think saying we cannot make those findings would be okay. But what this decision is based on is what may or may not happen. And that I don't think is okay. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Um, just a second, Mr. Reedy. Um, I, it appears to me that there's, a, that there's not, this, this needs four votes to, to pass. There are two options. One is to vote it down, and want us to allow them to withdraw. The implications of that for us is that if we vote it down, it's it can't come back in its same form for two years. If we allow them to withdraw, they would be they could bring it back up at some point, but it'd be I don't think that would be a good use of our time or their time. But they could bring back something else that might be um, to which the board might be amenable. Um, I don't know what that is unless you'd be willing to say we're only going to rent to families. I mean, that might that might change the whole context here, but um, I think that is uh, that may not get you the four votes either. But um, so that, that's I think those are the two options I see. And instead of going because I, I, I do want I will just um, state for the record that I don't that I don't think I can vote for this and still meet the findings I have to make under 10.3, um, 10.380, 381, 382, and 385. And I don't think it's consistent with 10.30, the special, the purpose of the special, um, of the Zoning Board of Appeals, the second sentence of that, of that uh, clause. But, um, so I wanna give, um, but I would prefer to give the opportunity for the applicants to withdraw this than to penalize them and to prevent them from um, coming back with a different type of um, application in the future within the two-year frame. So um, that would be my recommendation to the board, but I'm willing to listen to other people. I suspect that's what you were going to talk about, Mr. Reedy. If it is, um, yeah, okay. It is, yeah. Let's see what, I'd like to hear from board members uh, on that as well. I almost feel as if that whatever they do, it will not satisfy the neighbors. You know, I, it, that may be the case, that may be the case, but I, I, I sense, and this is you know, not what I'm basing my decision on, but I sense from the neighbors that they also might say, well, if you can rent, if you can create a, a three and four uh, bedroom home that is rented out to families, and you could choose to do that. I mean, the landlord could choose to say, I'm going to rent it out to families. The landlord could choose to put that in their management plan. The landlord could do that if they want to. We can't impose that. We can't, as a board, say you have to rent this out to families. There might be a different response, but I, that's not the case right now. And, and they they could rent it out to families. They could rent it out to students. And I think you're right, Mr. Henry. 
I think the concern from the board and concern from the neighbors is about students. And I, I think they'd probably, and my guess is people would be more welcoming if it was, if it was families, because that does really create a much needed rental housing option for families in this town. But that's not what we have before us right now. So uh, the question for me is, do we want to uh, permit them to withdraw it or do we want to vote it down? And I, and I would move, I would accept, I would entertain a motion that we allow the applicant to withdraw this uh, application and um, recognizing that in doing so, um, it would not work to their advantage to bring back a, similar, a very similar proposal within the next couple of years, rather than uh, defeating it. Do I have a second on that motion? So moved. I, I heard Mr. Meadows. Is there discussion about that? I know there's the concern that they could forum shop with a different board, but that could be that would be in a, in a year or two, and I'm not sure that it would, those conditions that the uh, mm -hmm. that it would change. So, any discussion, Mr. Slobiter? I have a question. I want to make sure I understand something. If they are if we vote it down, then they cannot come back for two years. Is that correct? With the same, with basically the same proposal. Same proposal. Right. If they withdraw, if I remember from another case, they can withdraw with or without prejudice, or is that? Am I not remembering that it's, correctly? It's not really a. It's not really a, a provision to allow them to withdraw with prejudice. That is what we do when we vote it down. So you okay. can allow them to withdraw. Or you or you vote it down. That's really your two choices. Okay. We, you know, and if, they, if they withdraw, when when can the applicant come back with a new or identical proposal for another try? They could come back. What's a time factor? I don't think there is a time factor. I okay. think they can come back at any time. But I think they with a with four with a four to one vote. I think. They're not going to come back with the same proposal, and they might, but I think it would be quickly dispensed with. But they might come back with another proposal that uh, the board may want to entertain. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. May, may I ask a question? Yes, um, Mr. Henry. Sure. I, I, I do not mean to put the board members on the spot, but if Miss Marcy comes back, um, appreciating that they've done so much work investment to this property. If they come back with a management plan that says we'll only rent to families, will they get the support of this board? I'll speak for myself. I'm much more inclined to allow that. I I want to think through. I you know the traffic is still an issue. I think that's much more likely to be. You know you're not going to have ten cars. You're going to have four, maybe, maybe three. I would. I'd have to think about that. But I'm. I am much more inclined to allow that because that's consistent with what other uses in the neighborhood. There are um, non-owner occupied rental property. There is some non-owner occupied rental property that is fam own occupied by families. And so, I, and I think that does also speak to one of the needs we have, but I, I can't speak for the rest of the board members and, and maybe they don't want to uh, propose that. And I really can't, I can't commit, but I, I'm inclined to be more sympathetic to that because of the, less impact on the neighbors than I would see with, with students. It's also less money. And so it's there. It's, it's hard for them to do that. Um, they sunk some money into this, and this is not a decision that I think any of us take lightly at all. Ms. Bestrup has her hand up. Oh, Ms. Bestrup, go ahead. Thank Hi, you. I just wanted to point out my, my hand disappears into the sky. Um, yeah. I believe that our definition of family includes for unrelated people. So oh, you would have to get more specific about exactly what your definition of family is if you were to entertain that kind of a condition. You, you could use the second, I think it's the second clause of that family definition where it talks about um, people who are related by marriage, bond, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there is, Four unrelated, I mean, four unrelated individuals can be a family, a family as we generally think of it, either through marriage or through, through a, a other kind of common bond could be a family or it could be, you know, a, but I would, yeah, I mean, you, you're right, Ms. Brestrup, there's a, um, um, a complication 
in trying to define what family is. It's not common usage. Mr. Meadows. Oh, you're, you're uh, muted. I think I may have seconded or maybe I didn't, depending on whether I was muted or not. But I was <laughs> I going to. <laughs> Good, thank I was, you. I was going to because, you know, on the assumption that they're going to listen to their attorney. And Mr. Reedy is very cognizant of what this board might like, might be prone to accept, and what we won't. And based upon that, I I was willing to accept it and allow them to withdraw because it's better for them to have the ability to do something rather than nothing for a period of time. Yeah. Um, it's it, me again. It doesn't, it doesn't do away with the safety factor. That's a problem, though. Ms. Preston? Don't you need a request from the applicant to withdraw in order to approve the withdrawal rather than just approving the withdrawal without having I, that request? You know, I think you're, I think you're right. Um, and if, I can read, if I can read body language, <laughs> I think there's a request waiting to make. <laughs> Yeah, for, I mean, for all the reasons that you mentioned, and Mr. Meadows especially, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, we've listened. Um, there may be or there might not be, right? And at this point, I just don't know what it looks like. We're not going to bring back the same thing because, you know, Mathena's not going to spend the same amount of money to come back through when we know the results. So it would have to be some difference where we think it would, you know, probably talk to the neighbors, see if we can get that. But at least we're appreciative of the opportunity to have the opportunity to try. And, and so we would request that withdrawal without prejudice. Great, okay. Well, let's, um, I think we've had enough discussion about this. Let's turn to a vote on to allow the application to be withdrawn. Um, this requires four votes. The chair votes aye. Um, Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Sloviter? No. Mr. Henry? Aye. Aye. The vote is four to one. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Thanks for your yeah. time. Yep, the application is withdrawn. All right. Um, there's no other business before us, no other applications. The next order of business tonight is public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. So. Um, Ms. Williams, if you would just bring up the participants and see if anybody wishes to speak on any matter except those things which we had before us tonight. Not seeing any hands. Um, let's give everybody a second for them to find the uh, raise hand function. And they haven't. So the next order of business, being there no public comments, would be to go through um, um, new business and Ms. Brestra, can you uh, kind of relay what's going to be our next couple of hearings and I will um, also get out my schedule. I can talk about the next few meetings, but um, Jacinta or Ms. Williams and Mr. Mara may have a better hand on um, the pulse of what is coming in the future. Um, but the next few meetings will be um, August 8th. You have Amherst Development Associates, which is Kurt Shumway, who owns the University Motor Lodge. And he'll be coming to you with a request to um, approve a social dormitory under Section 9.22 of the Zoning Bylaw. In other words, the University Motor Lodge is non-conforming. It's a non-conforming use. And he would propose to turn it into another non-conforming use, which would be a social dormitory. And at that same meeting, um, you would have Carolyn Murray, attorney Carolyn Murray from KP Law, coming to talk to you and um, give you a, a primer on the 40B process, which many of you have been through already, but um, 
I think it's worthwhile to go through it again. So um, she'll be spending probably an hour to an hour and a half presenting the 40B comprehensive permit process and then answering questions. And then on <clears throat> August 22nd, you have Jonathan Murray, no relation to Carolyn Murray, um, an attorney from KP Law coming to talk to you about the legal aspects of solar installations. You also have uh, Canton Ave. The Wilson brothers own a property on Canton Avenue and it's a flag lot and they want to um, put a duplex on the flag lot. They had received permission to put a single family home there, but now they want to put a two family home there, non owner occupied. And then you also have um, 161 Chestnut Avenue, um, which is a new owner that owns this building. It is a duplex. It is already a, an existing duplex, but I think in the past it's been um, an owner-occupied duplex, and they want to turn it into a non-owner-occupied duplex. And then on August 29th, you have um, the first public hearing of the comprehensive permit for the Wayfinders project, and that is the project that is um, the East Street School and the Belchertown Road property and the town has been working with Wayfinders to develop this um, affordable housing development. It's going to be 78 uh, units, and you'll be asked to approve that under a comprehensive permit. And then the only the next thing we have that I know about is that Jonathan Clayt will be coming back uh, to talk to you about 47 Redgate Lane on October 10th. And it, as I said before, um, Ms. Williams or Mr. Mora may have knowledge of other things that are coming along that I don't know about. You covered everything. Um, and I know that we continued Shootsbury to September 12th. So did we want to try to go over the schedule again for Wayfinders um, with all the dates or do you wanna save that for the public hearing on August 29th? You know what, I, I think what would make sense is to send board members a schedule for them to look at as opposed to us doing it all the time. I mean, there's, in essence, what we're thinking about is over the next several months, going from two to three meetings a month in order to, in order to complete the, the um, 40B application, which is just, they always just take a lot of time. And what we would be doing is having a regular ZBA meeting for one, having um, a rec uh, one meeting dedicated to Wayfinders, that's the 40B, and one meeting where we'd split some of, we do some of our regular work and we do some of the, the 40B stuff. So we're trying to, I'm trying to manage it as best I can and I don't wanna, I don't wanna overburden people. And I wanna be able to do the 40B at the same time we have to, we have just regular stuff that comes in beyond the 40B. So we're looking at, um, you know, perhaps up to three, three, um, meetings a month. And I also think at this point, it might be, you know, it gives us an op also gives an opportunity to, to bring some of the associate members in on some of the um, regular business that we have. But I think that the 40B should be um, determined by the full members of the, of the CBA and not, not the associate members. So Ms. Williams, what I think we should do is send out that schedule that we discussed see if that works for members and have them respond to you about whether they can attend those days and try as opposed to trying to do it here uh, in a discussion, which is always. Um, sure, difficult. I can do that. Yeah, let's do it that way. And is there, but beyond that, do we have much in the, in the kind of the, um, in the gateway to come, us, come to us or is it, uh, is it kind of slowed down, Rob? Um, I don't want to jinx anything, but it, it's reached a manageable pace. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's good news. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, anybody else have any questions or comments for staff, for each other? All right. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Meadows. I was just, what is a social dormitory? It's, I'll let Mr. Moore answer that. Well, that's, that's the cl used classification in our bylaw. So, you know, the, the most recently used um, or building where that was used is Olympia Place. 
Uh, it was an archipelago project. Uh, they built one uh, building there. It's apartment style dormitory. Uh, it's uh, all the occupants are somehow um, affiliated with one of the colleges, uh, enrolled in one of the colleges or university. Uh, so it's it's specifically student housing uh, in, in apartment style in its form. And that's that's the proposal that's coming to you similar to uh, on a much smaller scale than the uh, the buildings out on uh, Olympia Drive. OK. Thank you. Right. OK. If there is no other uh, comments for the good of the group, I would entertain a motion that we adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. So it's been moved and seconded that we adjourn. The vote occurs on the motion to adjourn. The chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. We the time is 858, two minutes before nine o'clock. We got done before the nine o'clock hour and we are adjourned. Thank you all for your work and for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.